Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's National Conference of State Legislatures webinar, Countdown to Real ID, Next Steps for States. My name is Ben Hush, staff for NCSL's Natural Resources and Infrastructure Committee, and I'll be your moderator today. Before I introduce today's speakers, I want to review a few housekeeping items. Above the presentation, you will see a couple tabs with one of them labeled Resources. Here you can find and download a PDF version of the PowerPoint as well as some other handouts. Another tab is labeled Speaker where you can read the bio of today's speakers. You can access these tabs at any time during the presentation. And of course, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on NCSL's website early next week. And of course, please feel free to submit any questions at any time by typing into the chat box in the lower left. We will hold Q&A after our speakers finish presenting. But back to why we are here today. Over the next 45 or so minutes, uh, we will receive an update from the Department of Homeland Security on the coming full enforcement of Real ID at commercial airports, which is now less than nine months away. Here to help us understand the current state of play and a little bit of the history of Real ID are two excellent speakers from DHS. First up, we have Steve Yonkers, who currently serves as the Director of Biometrics and Credentialing Policy, including the Real ID program, for the Department of Homeland Security. He has been a career federal employee for 27 years. Next, we will hear from Alex Zemek, Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Department of Homeland Security. He serves in the Office of Strategy, Policy, and Plans, where he oversees screening and vetting policies, including Real ID. Prior to joining DHS, he served at the Department of Commerce and the National Defense Industrial Association. Alex and Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. And with that, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Ben. And thank you so much, everyone, for having us here today. Really appreciate it. So I'm just going to move to uh, the next slide. So just a little bit of an overview of Real ID. So I'm sure you've heard by now Real ID came out of a recommendation from the 9-11 Commission. Uh, when they were looking at how easy it was for the hijackers to get a variety of different driver's licenses and identification cards from different states, they took a look across the states and realized there really were no standard practices. There was no minimum security level, if you will, for verifying identity, making sure people are who they say they are and the right people were getting licenses. And so as a result of that, looking at the next slide, Congress passed the Real ID Act back in 2005. So the act requires two main things. First, it set that ground floor, minimum level requirements for all states to meet for issuing driver's licenses and identification cards. States could add more requirements if they wish to do so. In fact, many do, but at least have a minimum ground floor for everyone to meet. So therefore, the federal government could look at these real IDs, if you will, as trusted credentials. So the second requirement then is then on the federal government for us to only accept these trusted credentials or real IDs from the states. And it's for three main purposes. One, accessing federal facilities. Uh, second, entry nuclear power plants, which probably does not apply to most of us. But then third, the big one, of course, is commercial flying, which probably affects all of us. Now, the act applies to the entire nation. It's all 50 states, D.C., and the territories. And it authorized DHS to do several things. First, to issue regulations and set the standards for compliance. We issued the regulation back in 2008. It's essentially the same regulation that we're still using today. The act also allows to determine whether the state was meeting the requirements. And the way this actually works is that the states actually implement a real ID program, begin issuing licenses, and then they actually self-certify to DHS that they're meeting all requirements. They actually submit a full package and then we usually spend a few months going back and forth, just checking everything, making sure everything's complete. And then finally, the state is granted uh, compliance or approval as a compliant state. The other thing it allowed us to do, it gave discretion to the secretary to provide states extensions of time as needed to come into full compliance. And so over the years, just about every state has had an extension of time uh, for one purpose or another to fully meet all requirements. In fact, as I'm sure you probably know, Many states have taken this opportunity to re-engineer their entire process, to bring in new IT systems, to actually truly modernize the way you see driver's licenses. In fact, and oftentimes, the entire Department of Transportation may have had new systems and new things put in place. And of course, many states have added new driver's license agencies and other things to really make it easier for people to get driver's licenses and ID cards. The last thing it allowed us to do was give grants to the states. So Congress appropriated $263 million in fiscal years 9 through 11. The states have spent that money 
There's been no additional appropriation since that time. However, the states can use Homeland Security grants that they receive every year. They can use a portion of those grants, something like 20%, for implementing the OLED programs if they wish to do so. So to, go to get a little bit more into the nitty gritty of real ID requirements, so real ID really requires three main things. First, that we verify a person's identity and lawful status in the United States. It also requires that the states issue a secure credential, something that's tamper resistant, something that you can't just falsify, swap out a photo or do something like that to it. And then third, the states have a secure issuance process. That begins with the employees themselves. Every employee at a DMV that handles our personal information has to undergo background investigation to make sure we don't have criminals working in the DMVs. It also requires the states to have secure procedures, processes, secure IT systems, uh, even for the infrastructure, the buildings themselves to be secure. In fact, every state submits a security plan to DMV, uh, and uh, submits their security plan to DHS for our review and approval. And then what does really do not require or not do? Obviously, did not create a national ID card. Every state still issues its own driver's license, its own look and feel. It didn't give us any authority to authorize, authorize or I should say, I'm sorry, um, to regulate DMVs. So we don't get into the nitty gritty of their business day to day. We don't tell them how to do their business. Essentially, they're either meeting all reality requirements or they're not. And then the last thing, it allowed states to give the residents a choice of whether they're gonna get a real ID or a non-compliant card. In fact, all but six states give the residents that choice. And what we're finding is actually many people have been getting this non-compliant card. I don't think it's ideal because you can't use this non-compliant card for real ID purposes, which means come October 1st, 2020, for the millions of people who went out and got the non-compliant card, it's gonna be no good for flying come October. So we're hoping people understand that when they make that choice, that it's certainly still good for driving and voting and banking and all the other things that you'd use a license for. It's not gonna be good for ID purposes. So let's show you a little bit about the current state status. So this is actually looking back about three years ago and you can see things weren't looking so good at that point. We only had 26 states that were compliant. We had something like 13 states, and I'm sure you're aware of this, had laws on the books, preventing them from even coming into compliance with real ID. In fact, with some states, they couldn't even pick up the phone and talk to us about Real ID. That's what the laws required. So that was back in 2017. And now you look today, this is the past October of 2019. So now you can see that all states are actually fully committed to complying with Real ID. We have 51 states that are compliant. And we're actually down to just a couple states in one territory that actually haven't begun issuing yet. So American Samoa has actually begun issuing in the next week or so. Uh, Oklahoma is going to begin issuing uh, late spring. Oregon is not going to begin until the first week of July, but they are the last ones to begin issuing. Everyone else is issuing real IDs. And so if you look at, say, New Jersey, which is in blue, New Jersey has been issuing for some time. They've submitted their compliance package to us. And we're actually in the process of reviewing it with them. And we expect very shortly that they'll, you'll see them as the next compliance state. And same thing with the other territories. So we're actually getting very close now. So a couple of other things I want to cover today. These are some things that have happened over the past 12 months. First, regarding residents of freely associated states. So individuals from Micronesia, Palau, Marshall Islands, they have a compact with the United States. They're able to come and go to the United States as they please to work and live. And in the past, they could only get limited one-year licenses. They actually had to come back every year and get a new driver's license. And so Congress actually changed the law about a year ago so they can now get full term licenses. And then we made another little change to the regulation so they no longer need a valid visa as part of their application for real ID. In fact, as it turned out, most of the residents of the freely associated states didn't need a valid visa to come into the United States in the first place, so it didn't really make sense or require that to get a real ID. So that was a change that we made this past year. And so now they're all able to get full term real ID licenses. The next issue is regarding acceptance of marked non-compliant cards. So when we look at the reg, it clearly shows that we're going to stop accepting legacy licenses on October 1st, 2020, but it wasn't clear when we we're going to stop accepting marked non-compliant cards. The assumption, of course, was it all happened at the same time. But still, it was unclear, and DOD decided, as part of making a major security change update uh, about a year ago, 
that they are going to act then and actually stop accepting marked non-compliant cards. And so they've actually been slowly rolling that out over the past year. For DHS purposes, what we did is actually made a very small change to the regulation to make it clear that we're actually going to do everything at one time. So this coming October 1st, 2020, is when we'll stop accepting legacy cards, we'll stop accepting marked non-compliant cards, and then we'll only accept either real ID compliant cards or acceptable alternatives like a passport. Something else I want to mention is about real ID adoption numbers. The big question, of course, is, hey, I could see it. there's a sea of green in that map you just showed us, Steve, but how are they doing? Are they actually getting a lot of these cards issued? So we did a check this past summer. We did a data call with all the states. At that time, we found there was about 67 million real IDs issued in circulation, representing about 27% of all licenses out there. And then we went back this past fall and we sent a letter to the states and said, hey, is it possible to get this information on a monthly basis so we could start tracking how we're doing from, from month to month? And the most recent numbers we have now show that over 95 million people have real IDs. So good, good improvement. And now we're at least 34% of driver's licenses and IDs that are real ID compliant. Something else I want to talk about was an RFI we did. We did a request for information in November. And this was looking at ways we could streamline the real ID issuance process. So as you can imagine, the law came out in 2005, the regulation in 2008. There's been numerous advancements in technology since then. As you know, you can do a lot of things. That, we didn't even have iPhones then. Now we have iPhones. You can do all types of things, uh, financially and otherwise, on your iPhones. And so a lot of the states and the public said, you know, isn't there a way to streamline this process? Do I have to find a physical document of all the source documents? Do I bring, have to bring everything physically into a DMV? You know, aren't there some ways we can streamline, make this process easier and faster? And so we said, you know, you're probably right. There probably are some things we could do. So let's get all the proposals that are out there. So we issued the RFI in early November. Uh, the RFI process closed on December 9th. We received 69 responsive comments. I'm gonna say that probably represented over 100 individual proposals. And so what we've been doing since, since then is evaluating each of these proposals for viability. So first, that they're something that would make a difference, that they actually would be useful to, to the consumer, to the TMV, that they actually could be implemented, and that also that they would not increase security risk, that they would not increase the risk of fraud or identity theft. Last thing we'd want is for someone to be submitting documents, say, electronically, and then have it be stolen and misused and those types of things. So what we wanted to look through every proposal from that point of view. So we're still going through that process. I can tell you we see a number of things that actually do look fairly viable. I can't speak to specifics right now, but what I can tell you is working as quickly as possible to take action on the most viable proposals so that we can get those new tools into the hands of the DMVs so they can be applying them this year or as quickly as possible to make it easier and faster for people to get real IDs before the October 1st, 2020 deadline. The last thing I just want to note is regarding something called mobile driver's licenses. You've probably been hearing about this. Your state may already be involved in uh, working on this project. A couple states actually are issuing um, MDLs today. This is essentially a digital representation of a driver's license on a phone. I like to make clear, and I'm sure you know, it's not just a picture of your ID on your phone. It's actually a a secure app that would be on your phone. It's something we would get after we get the physical license. So the idea, you'd already have your physical license that's in your wallet or in your pocket. And instead of having to pull that out to uh, go through a checkpoint or something like that, you could just show your phone. So for example, in the future, the way we'd see this working is you're going through uh, the airport, you show your boarding pass on your phone. You could also show your driver's license or identification card on your phone. And then the, uh, the airport would actually electronically be able to verify that you are the true holder of that document, and it's a true and valid document. So we're actually very excited about MDLs. It's something that we see coming out in the future. It's not something that's coming out immediately. It's not tied to the real ID enforcement deadline, uh, but it is something we're working on, so I did want to mention that. So the next slide, just to show you about the phase enforcement schedule. This is just to show that we've actually been enforcing Real ID for some time. Uh, we began in DHS headquarters way back in 2014, and we've been slowly rolling it out to larger and bigger facilities over time. We started with the biggest, with the federal facilities, 
And then you can see now we're at the final phase with boarding commercial aircraft. And you can see right there in red, we're at that last enforcement deadline of October 1st, 2020. So we still get the question, of course, though, but what is going to happen on October 1st, 2020? What happens if I show up at the airport, I don't have a real ID, and I don't have one of those acceptable alternatives? And unfortunately, the bottom line is the person's not going to be able to get to the security checkpoint. They're going to have to be turned away. They're probably going to miss their flight. And that's just the reality we want people to understand so that there's no surprises uh, come October 1st. So the other question, of course, then is, but what are these acceptable alternatives? Do I have to get a real ID? The answer is you don't. In fact, many people already have a U.S. passport. You can see it's the number one thing listed on the list here. There's over 140 million passports in circulation today. A lot of people already have them. Many others have enhanced driver's licenses or military cards. And you can see there's a variety of other forms of identification that are perfectly acceptable for getting to the security checkpoint. And in fact, most federal agencies use the exact same list as TSA for allowing people to get in as well. So there's a lot of options out there. Now, making sure everyone is aware of the deadline is one of the big things we're working on right now. So in terms of outreach, the most important things for us is that people are first aware that there is this requirement and they're getting themselves prepared in advance. So the states, obviously, the onus is on the states, the ones that are producing the real IDs. Uh, they know their residents. They have the best opportunities to communicate with their residents. And as you can expect, they're probably doing the most things. They're doing a wide range of activities from websites to getting out in the communities, newspaper ads, advertising, radio, you name it. You're probably seeing most of the activity from the states that have been issuing more recently over the last several years. There's probably at least a dozen states they're essentially done. They've been doing Real ID for so long. They've actually been through the entire population, and they actually don't have to worry about it. For all the others, though, they still need to get the word out, and so many of them have marketing and advertising campaigns to just do that. Now, from the federal government side, we're doing everything we can as well. In fact, TSA has really stepped up. They actually created their own special website this past year, just about uh, almost a year ago. They have a Real ID marketing toolkit, so it shows actual images of the signs that are now showing up at the checkpoints. You've probably already been seeing some signage. Uh, you're going to start seeing a new sign. It's actually six feet tall. Uh, it's going to be in every security checkpoint. We're very excited about this because we realize when people are walking through the checkpoint, you know, their focus is just trying to get through the process. And so we have to make it even that more visible, that more obvious for someone to take note. We've also been working with the states and the airports to look at ways to get things into other parts of the airports and actually get the states into the airports to either issue real IDs or at least provide communication materials, provide information, help people understand that this is coming, and also to help explain what are the requirements, particularly if they're a little different from state to state, to get uh, the states out there with the people. A couple other things that we've been doing is working with, of course, uh, the airlines themselves. Uh, we've met individually, I think, with every airline now. Every airline is rolling out their own marketing advertising plans. They're doing a lot of things electronically. And so if you've not already been seeing it, you're going to see all kinds of advertisings and warning labels. Uh, so when people go and buy a ticket, you're going to see that. Now, generally, I think the understanding is that maybe only about 30% of all tickets are actually bought directly from an airline. So it's the Expedia, Travelocity, it's the other organizations that are probably doing the bulk of tickets. We're also reaching out to them as well so that they get out the same messaging. Because at the end of the day, we don't want anyone to buy an airline ticket and not be fully aware and prepared for the real ID requirements. Now, with my last slide, just for more information, so we do have two different websites. There's the main DHS website. This would probably tell you everything you ever wanted to know and more about Real ID. It even has the law, the regulation. It has a lot of FAQs. Commonly asked questions are up there. And then, of course, there's the more focused TSA website. Uh, at the very bottom, we do have a public email address. You can give that out um, to, to your customers. So it's realid at hq.dhs.gov. We were getting about 20, 30 inquiries a week. Now we're getting closer to 150 to 200 inquiries a week. So it is, it is increasing quite a bit. And before I end the presentation, I do want to give uh, the opportunity to hand this off uh, to uh, Deputy Secretary Alex Zemeck uh, to say a few closing remarks. Hi, everyone. Alex Zemeck, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary here. I know Steve uh, has 
related to building off his last slide on public outreach, I know uh, we are talking on a regular basis with with um, members of, of industry, with uh, various DMVs of the state, with uh, legislators here at the federal level across uh, across our, our government. Um, we're doing what we can to uh, to get that word out as well as efforts we can take to uh, try to ensure that um, from our perspective the most number of, of real IDs can be in people's hands prior to the, the enforcement deadline. Um, and I know across the states, um, you know, the uh, statistics do vary greatly, but uh, as Steve mentioned, we are seeing uh, um, an improvement in the, the numbers that have gotten reported. Uh, we still encourage uh, the states to, uh, to be uh, forthcoming and sharing that data as, as that more information for us is, is helpful in, in assessing where, uh, where things, things stand. So thank you for all you can do to try to ensure that we get, uh, get input from, from your respective states uh, on a monthly basis. Thank you, and uh, I think we're welcome to have any, field any questions that you all might have. Yeah, Ben, back to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, very informative. Um, so maybe just to, I, I got a couple questions actually emailed to me from folks who couldn't who couldn't make this, but I want to start with um, at least one of the questions in the question box, um, and that is about state recognized tribal ID cards um, as a potential alternative. And I'm I'm not sure you know if 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 you are aware of the answer to that question, but I figure I'll, I'll, I'll throw it back to you kind of on, on that specific question. Right, so I will actually have to uh, um, refer that to TSA to answer that specific question. We actually had a, a meeting with uh, Native Americans and, and, and tribal members yesterday talking about that very subject. It's obviously a, a hot topic, uh, but for the purpose of this conversation, we'll have to defer back to them to answer this specific question. Great, and for the person um, who asked the question, I'll, I'll follow up with you offline to make sure that you get connected with TSA um, so you can ask them directly. Um, the w one question that I got e emailed beforehand, and uh, Steve, I, I know you you did kind of touch on this in your last slide, but I just want to make sure that, it, that it's clear. Um, you know, really just generally between now, um, February 13th, um, and October 1st, you know, what can state legislatures do to help with implementation, and are there specific DHS resources that they can make use of, either um, for education purposes, either for themselves or constituents, um, and just other resources that might be available, um, you know, given what I think, you know, as, as you alluded to with the number of uh, inquiries you're getting, the, the increase uh, in interest that this interest is only going to attract as we get closer to October. Sure. So what we always recommend is that the legislatures check in with their state agencies, the DMVs in particular, and ask both what are they doing to get the message out there, and then maybe they'll ask how they're doing in terms of resources. Do they have resources uh, to get everybody in? A number of states um, have increased hours, increased days of the week, have done a number of things. A, a couple of them even have mobile centers that actually go out on the road to get to the more rural communities of their states uh, to make it easier for those uh, residents to get uh, real IDs. So, you know, those are a few things that state legislatures could certainly do just to make sure that their own state has all the resources they need uh, to get real ideas issued. And this is, this is Alex. Uh, I'm like building off that, um, I think certainly hearing from, from the DMVs as far as what their, their needs are is key. Um, I wasn't sure if Steve had mentioned um, before I had joined, but um, as far as things that are available, uh, there is a certain percentage of their Homeland Security funds that states are permitted to use towards uh, supporting Real ID. I know some years you know, back in the 2000, almost a decade ago, um, the early 2011, 2012 period, there was a period of, of funds that um, would, existed for states, uh, and many were utilizing that to revamp their, their IT system. Um, there was 263 million back in, in 9 to 11. Um, we're not aware of, of anything that exists at the, the federal level that's been appropriated now, but um, you know, just bring that to the, the state's attention um, as far as what action you know, they might consider doing. Thank you. Um, the next question, I'm, I'm kind of going to incorporate 
um, one that was emailed to me and, and Steve a little bit on, on what you said. Um, obviously, the increase to about 95 million or so um, state compliant IDs representing 34% you know, if, if I'm remembering your, the stats correctly. Um, and obviously then 100 and I think um, when it comes to alternatives, you also mentioned about 140 million passports or so. Um, so the question really was kind of building off that as um, a, a base. Is DA or maybe is, is TSA specifically um, tracking the percentage of travelers that go through airport security with either a real ID, compliant ID, or another alternative ID? Um, I mean, when if someone is this is Alex, if someone is going through a checkpoint, uh, obviously if they're doing an international flight, they'd be having their passport there and would would bring that. They might not necessarily. Um, be showing their domestic uh, driver's license. So I don't think TSA is keeping statistics as far as requiring people to show, oh, what are you bringing with you that they can check all forms if they ha if they at, at present if they have one of the, the alternatives with them. You know, right now they're focusing on getting the people safely on their on their flight, screening them, informing them both in verbal commands and with the signage related to the upcoming deadline. But I don't think TSA is is trying to um, canvas the passengers that are going through from that statistical basis. But I will say that we're working closely with the um, some of the travel associations that periodically um, do surveys. And that's one thing that we're trying to um, encourage them to tease out in their surveys. Um, one of them, for example, U.S. Travel Association, I believe, is coming out in the in the next month, and we're trying to um, see if they can get a better uh, read on what is that um, donut hole or null set of the people who are out there that don't have a real ID, you know don't have a passport, don't have one of these things, or conversely, might not have a real ID, but have one of the alternatives to find out what is the actual subset of the people who don't have something. And the, and the second element is coupling that with, is that person going to be traveling October 1st, October 2nd, October 3rd? You know, getting a sense of, is, is there someone that, that plans to travel in the, the um immediate period of time when enforcement would take place to understand what truly is that affected population. Thank you. Um, and just a quick follow-up that just came in. Um, the most recent uh, data that DHS released, that maybe um, late last month I'll say, um, in terms of the number of compliant IDs, um, is, is there a specific date that that is as of? Um, and is there the ability um, to access updated information as the department provides it? Um, because we are reliant on the, the state um, governor's office or DMVs in many instances or, or secretary of states in some cases to be the ones that provide us the, the data, um, it's hard to give a precisely as of because um, we're getting it from 56, 56 different jurisdictions. We've requested for it to be sort of as of the end of X month, as of the end of X month, and get it to us within that next week. So, but to, to be more precise in that 95 million, that was roughly based on um, data that was through, I would say through October, uh, through um, November 30th, end of November, probably reported in December. But you had a few, a few states that might have been um, lagging in providing us that data so it might have been through you know december 10th for one state so it, it it's not uniform um we wish that it were uniform um i and i think in the um per the question of for the lead staff and and the public to have access to that number i think while we've just started to uh get into a cadence of getting this information from the states um, we wanted to have a couple more uh, data imports out there, but I think in the in the very near future, we intend to um, not only should there be you know a month a next monthly update to convey. I think we intend to also uh, uh, post on the DHS website sort of what is uh, the history of what uh, 
we've we've gotten input statistics wise from the state. So I think that's that's coming out. But as of now, that's the that's the the number that um, we've been able to compile. Um, and probably in the um, we're at uh, February 13th now. So probably in the next um, you know week or so, we can get a um, a read on on what states are outstanding, and then in some instances, we've had to go back to them and remind them, hey, can you send a, the Secretary of Homeland Security's ask for your numbers monthly? We really would appreciate that. It's helpful. So as we're trying to uh, get that info from the state, if we do have an updated number, we can, we can push that out timely, either through our public affairs or through just general postings to the public. Great. Thank you so much. And Steve, I didn't know if you wanted to take the next question. I know you you, you did address this, um, but just uh, given kind of the question um, in terms of what options uh, would be available to a traveler who um, showed up to the airport without a uh, either real ID compliant ID or an acceptable alternative post October 1. Sure, Ben. And so I went back to slide nine. Uh, I saw the comment on the chat. So as I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, if someone shows up that they don't have a real ID, or an acceptable alternative, then they're not going to be permitted to the security checkpoint. They're essentially going to be turned away. They're probably going to miss their flight. And so that's what most people need to know is, uh, you know, there doesn't, there doesn't exist uh, capabilities within TSA to somehow process in other ways, you know, thousands or, or millions of people. And so that's just, that's just the brutal reality, if you will, um, of people who, are, who don't come prepared uh, at the airport. Great, thank you. Um, one other area that I specifically wanted to ask about, um, and maybe not so much kind of focused on, on the ID itself, but um, Steve, you had that chart show, or not the chart, excuse me, you had the two slides showing the change in state compliance rates between 2017 and 2019. Um, obviously, one aspect of, of the act itself is uh, recertification. And so generally just kind of wondering how DHS was planning to handle recertifications kind of during this time period uh, prior to October 1, um, and just kind of generally how that was expected to work over the next eight months or so. Sure. So uh, we have uh, we are doing recertifications. In fact, the very first certification uh, went to Maryland, so that was, uh, I think, uh, late last year. Uh, the way we've been doing it was in groups of five, so it's another four states we're currently working on. We're actually working through the final stages, if you will, of completing their recertifications. And once we complete those, uh, then we'll probably start with the next group of five. Uh, we've not identified those five yet, so I can't tell you today uh, who they're going to be. Uh, but obviously, we're looking at the states uh, that have been compliant for a long time. Great. Um, and I wanted to follow up. Um, you talked a little bit about in one of your slides um, the RFI. Um, and I, I know you, you, you mentioned that you couldn't um, discuss any specifics. I guess maybe just um, to, to build off that, is for those potential solutions, are those um, solutions that the department w has existing authority to potentially implement? Or is that something that might require additional kind of statutory and then obviously uh, through legislation uh, from Congress? Exactly. We're looking through all of that. So looking at if there's an opportunity where we could just issue guidance to the states, readily do that, or if we're going to require either regulatory changes or statutory changes. And then obviously we have to work through those individual processes. Thank you. Um, and I don't know if you just, if, if you can also see it, um, the question that just came in in terms of um, the, the, the process for obtaining um, a real ID and just the, 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 the amount of time, um, at least in, at, in this example, and just uh, the question specifically was, you know, is there help at the individual level from the federal government in terms of fee waivers? Uh, nothing in terms of fee waivers. So obviously the states are the ones that are implementing their real ID programs. Um, I think this was a Pennsylvania example. Pennsylvania actually uh, had a step above in that they've actually been collecting the source documents for, for many years. That's actually enabled them uh, to probably get ahead of some of the other states in processing real IDs faster. Uh, but every state kind of has to make their own decision of how they're going to roll out their program. And of course, as you know, in, in terms of costs and other things, each state determines what the costs are uh, of getting ready, if it's going to be more or, or just maybe just the same as getting a normal driver's license. Um, so, and you can 
also probably see this. Uh, we just got a question um, in terms of um, airlines obviously knowing who is planning to fly post October 1 um, and you know are they able to contact those customers um, to certify that they have the appropriate ID and guessing I can know where this is going. We're, we're um, you know as Steve discussed earlier and I, I discussed we're continuing to work with with industry not only for just generally their their information going out to to their customers and the people that they, they interact with, but uh, you know, encouraging them in the example of someone that is purchasing a ticket to uh, have that be part of the um, material that would come up on a website, let's say that they were, if they were purchasing uh, the ticket that they would be um, identifying or reminding them about, about an ID. But uh, as far as uh, proactively emailing them to certify. Um, I don't know that I've heard that they have that in, in place yet, but it's, I know it's a continued dialogue that we have. Um, and as it relates to the outreach, um, just as I know we're doing at the federal level, and I know there are some of the um, there's senators that even have real ID signage outside their offices or when they interact with, with their constituents, certainly encourage the, the various state legislators to um, to be uh, amplifying the message and helping to get the word out to, to their constituents as well. Great. Well, um, with that, I would like to extend a final thank you um, to Alex and Steve. And of course, thank you to all the attendees for participating in today's webinar. Um, as a reminder, um, a record this webinar is being recorded and uh, we will be posting it uh, to NCSL's website early next week. Um, for the legislators and legislative staff on the call, um, if you think of any additional questions after the fact, please feel free to reach out to myself. Um, I um, have a, I am in communication with DHS staff regularly. Um, I appreciate all that they do to get back um, to me and obviously to the state legislators and legislative staff uh, quickly. So again, I just want to thank everyone for joining um, and have a great rest of the week and a enjoyable long weekend. So thank you again, Alex and Steve. Thanks for having us. Thank you.